Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. This week's video, we're gonna talk about clearing malfunctions on the handgun and getting away from parroted dogma on clearing malfunctions on the handgun. Now, of course, first things first, malfunctions do occur. However, they are less likely. Uh, what, I'm, what I mean by that is, it's unlikely for a carry condition, a very clean, as your CCW weapon should be, your handgun, uh, for it to malfunction. Can it malfunction? Absolutely, it can but it is less likely than more likely. You don't hear of too many malfunctions occurring on firearms in what I would consider a carry serviceable condition. It's clean, it's oiled, it's lubricated, whatever you want to call it. It's got good quality duty ammunition in it, good quality carry self-defense ammunition in it. You're not going to hear of too many malfunctions. But since they are on the table, they're on the list of possibilities, it's something that we do practice. Uh, me personally, uh, I do cover them in my handgun classes, but I don't beat them to death. And the reason for that is students are there to do other things. So if I cover a method, I introduce a method to clear a malfunction, and then the student is able to replicate and do it on the range, uh, we leave it alone. I'm not going to spend 45 minutes burning up that student's time going over the same malfunction drills over and over and over and over and over again, because later on in the class I'm going to either induce full power malfunctions and or they're going to experience malfunctions on their own, so they don't really need my help. That's something they can practice to proficiency at home. But since malfunctions do occur, uh, no matter the quality of the handgun, malfunctions are going to occur. Uh, it's something that has to be addressed. Unfortunately, um, there are some methods being taught that are very, very antiquated, and it's uh, as if not everybody's on the same page with new solutions that have been developed to old problems. Uh, on the semi-automatic handgun, uh, you've got three common types of malfunctions. You've got a failure to fire, uh, you've got a stovepipe, which is more common in all metal frame guns, but you can still see it on the polymer frame guns. Uh, and then you've got what's known as, what's colloquially known as a double feed. Uh, and we're going to go over all three of those and we're going to address the methods. And I might even be able to show you a new and faster way to do something. Now, the first kind of malfunction, the malfunction that, that um, I see the most is a failure to fire. Uh, usually what that means is there's a trigger press and the striker hits the primer, nothing happens. Maybe it's an empty chamber or maybe it's a bad round, which is why the method to clearing it was developed the way it was. Um, this particular firearm, I got my agency Glock 19. I know that the second round in this gun is a training round. It's a dummy round. This little polymer orange tip rounds. You get these from the NRA store online. They're probably the cheapest dummy rounds out there, uh, and they're awesome. Uh, you can buy, I think they're about 80 cents a piece, maybe a little more, and they last pretty much forever, and they're good to mix in your magazines and work on this kind of drill. You don't want to beat it to death, uh, but it is something you need to practice. So I know my second round in this gun is going to be a failure to fire. So I'm going to go ahead. Then I reset and I get a click. Now the click tells me the striker has fallen and it either hit an empty chamber because the magazine wasn't seated or that's a bad round and I need to get it out of the gun. Now, everything's back to functioning. The thing about that malfunction is it's immediately diagnosed by the nature of the trigger press. And as I'm gonna show you, Pretty much all malfunctions, at least on striker fired guns, and every gun's gonna be a little different, can be diagnosed either by the trigger press or what the gun looks like in your peripheral vision. So our method to clearing a failure to fire is the tap, the rack, the reassess. Now if you'll notice, the way I rack my gun may be different from what you're used to. Most people will tap, come over the top, or they'll tap inboard, for you right-handed, inboard, or maybe you'll come over the top. Those are the methods. Me, I come up front. Why? Because I'm more comfortable there. It gives me a lot more torque and a lot more control on the gun. Just like that. Now, of course, the danger some people might say is, well, you're covering the ejection port. I'm really not. Uh, the angle may make it look that way, but I'm giving sufficient room that with inboarding the gun, with the assistance of gravity, I'm not gonna uh, knock that casing or knock that uh, unfired round or bad striker round back into the gun. Now, our next malfunction I'm gonna go over is our uh, stovepipe. Uh, it's not as common on modern guns, but it still happens. And basically, 
that's what you get. Now yeah, I set it up, I just pulled the frame back like that, I put it in there, I can do it right handed the same way, just go over the top, however you gotta set it up, that's what you get. It can be on the top, it can be out of the side, it can be long ways in the gun, but it's going to be in there. Now, what's different in this malfunction than the failure to fire? Well, I can tell you right now that the trigger press is gonna be different. I have a dead trigger. I've got no tension coming all the way back to the rear wall. That immediately tells me, not a failure to fire situation. Now, if I press that trigger and that's the feel I get, what do I do? I, just human nature, am probably gonna look at the gun. And it's not a bad idea as long as you keep it in your so-called workspace. I wanna keep it in my peripheral vision on my visual horizon, I see brass. Some people's desire is to either grab that or try to sweep it out of the gun. That can work, but the best way to clear this is the same way you fix a failure to fire. You tap the bottom of the magazine, rack, gun functions. Now, some people might say, why tap the bottom of the magazine if it's a stovepipe? Just go ahead and cover that base. That's my personal advice. Some people may disagree with that. I don't feel like it's necessarily adding a step. I feel like it's just going ahead and reassuring that the magazine is functioning correctly. Can a magazine aid in the in, in inducing a stovepipe? It can, it's rare. Um, there's not a way to directly diagnose that. But since I'm already there, and since I can use one method to clear two different types of malfunctions, I might as well practice that same method. Now, I bring this up because I know of one situation where it's happened. There was an officer in Lawrenceville, Georgia, I believe this was back in 2007, um, who had been rotating the same two rounds through the chamber of his gun over and over again. He'd get home, he'd download, whatever. In the morning, put the magazine in, rack it, take that round, put it on top of the magazine, mag in the gun, go 10-8. He did that for about six months. We had a shooting situation. Drew his gun, pressed out, click. Immediate action, tap rack, click. Immediate action, tap rack, finally he was able to shoot and stop the threat. He had two failure to fires. They traced it back to the fact that those rounds had been rotated through the chamber so much that the primer compound in those rounds had been knocked out of the primer and they just failed to ignite. So he had two failure to fires in a row. What's the probability of that happening to you? Well, you have to ask yourself right now, how often do you rotate those rounds, those same two rounds, through the chamber? Now, is there a short circuit we can take? Is there a shortcut we can take if something like that happens? Well, right now I have the gun set up. Uh, I don't know exactly how many malfunctions are in there. Two, could be three. So let's see what happens. So I draw out, I press, click. Okay, I had an actual trigger press. That tells me it's a failure to fire. Tap, rack, reset, click. At this point, should I tap and rack again? I saw that brass come out. I saw a round come out of the gun. I know it happened. I heard it. I felt it. I saw it in my peripheral vision. So can I short circuit or shortcut my clearance process? Can I just now rack? Got another click. I saw brass again. Do I need to go back to tap every single time? I don't think so. Eventually, I will get either to a working round or I will find out that something inside of my gun internally is not allowing it to fire. That was three bad rounds. Is that possible? Well, I just told you a story about a guy who had two, and there's other stories out there. Again, they are very, very rare, but they do occur, and it's usually blamed on how often you're rotating those rounds through the gun, because every time you chamber that round, it's putting a lot of pressure, it can cause setback, and it can knock that primer compound out of the primer. This is just one method you can use if you know the gun is cycling and you know the extractor's working, you know the magazine's seated because it keeps feeding rounds into that chamber, go ahead and stop tapping and just keep racking. And if you get to a point where it's like, okay, this gun doesn't work, then obviously you need to come up with a different solution to the problem here. So now we get to the holy grail of malfunctions. Worst case scenario in the handgun, a what's colloquially known as a double feed. The chamber has not been cleared and a round is attempting to strip off the top of the magazine and follow that round into the chamber. So. There's a couple different ways you can set this up. Uh, you can use a live round, which I don't really recommend unless you're just practicing the technique. Um, I do recommend you take a spent casing in your caliber, uh, drop it into the chamber, insert the magazine, and then hit the release. Or you can pull back if you want. So now I have a double feed. This is a best case scenario double feed because it is administratively induced. It's not a full power double feed. It didn't occur under cycling of the gun. But this is what we have. now. What most people know, what most people, what most methods are, the method most people were taught to clear this, and I know this was the first method I learned, was to lock the slide to the rear, strip the magazine, 
either discard it or if it's the only one you have retain it rack the gun one maybe two maybe three times i've never heard anybody taught to do it more than three times how many times did i have to rack it before that casing came out of the gun then they would reinsert the magazine rack it and reassess their threat that takes a long time um, there's nothing wrong with that method however is there a faster way to do it now i Again, I'll get into this. I thought I'd developed this myself. I thought I was the smartest person in the world. Turns out uh, the method I'm about to show you was a method that a few other instructors already knew about. I had been working on it for about a year and a half to two years, and I was confident in the fact that it worked on every single gun I had encountered up to that point. At this point, there aren't too many guns out there that this method has not been tested on under range conditions and full power malfunction conditions. Uh, so I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody about it. So talk to a few other instructors and like oh yeah I know about that and I'm like when uh, when were you you gonna let me in on it uh, because it's an amazing method that definitely shortens the time it takes for me to clear that malfunction but I'm gonna share it with you now um, we'll set up the same malfunction I'll go ahead and find myself a piece of nine millimeter brass and I'll stick it in the gun there we go then I'll put my magazine back in and I'll release the slide so same malfunction just thinking right now, what's the fastest way to clear this malfunction? Well, I can tell you right now, I'm gonna hit that magazine release, I'm gonna purchase the magazine, and I'm gonna strip the magazine. Now, I've always been told you can't do that. Um, I've yet to find a gun that won't allow me to do it. So now, I've stripped the magazine, slide has gone forward, it's not out of battery, nothing like that. I can rack it if I want to, or I can immediately reinsert the magazine and take that little bit of risk to gain that little bit of time. But I'm gonna go ahead and rack it. I had brass come out. So now, do I need to rack it two or three or five or 10, 15, 25 more times? No, I can take the magazine in the condition it's in, put it right back in the gun, rack the gun, and I guarantee you, it'll fire. So, as far as a double feed clearance goes, I've just shortened the steps considerably, haven't I? Um, some of you may already know this method, but some of you may be sitting there at your TV screens or your computer screens or on your cell phone with your jaw open a little bit, because you're like, I've never seen that before. Um, this isn't me bragging, this is me sharing it with you because now I'm confident and comfortable to the point that it works on every single gun I've encountered. The only situation in which it does make it difficult is when you have a traditional floor plate magazine and a flared magwell on your gun. That does complicate getting in there to get that mag. And some people say, because of that, I wouldn't teach that method because there are guns out there with flared magwells. My argument to that is, if you lock the slide to the rear on a double feed gun, let's see what happens. So I'll go ahead and set it up one more time, drop that in there, put the magazine in, full power malfunction. Now when I lock it to the rear and I hit the button, does, this, does the magazine drop free? No, maybe pops out a little bit. I still have to strip the magazine no matter which method I use. So to me, that argument's kind of, kind of nonsensical. I'm still gonna have to strip the magazine. So the fact that this might not work on a flared magwell gun doesn't really compute to me. I still have to strip the mag. So no matter which method you use, that magazine still has to be stripped. Is it a little tougher to strip it with the slide pressure on it? A little bit, but not so much you can't do it. Um, 1911s, XDs, Glocks, M&Ps, SIGs, all manner of handguns come through my classes. I predominantly see the Glock handgun, uh, but I see M&P and XD and, and some other models as well pretty regularly, and I've yet to find a gun this does not work on. So. That's the shortened method for a double feed. All right, now that we've, I've shown you that new double feed clearance technique, if you're not familiar with it, uh, let's talk about some of the other dogma associated with this malfunction, or malfunctions in general. Now, do you think that the trigger feel, the trigger press on this malfunction is gonna be different than say a stovepipe or a failure to fire? I guarantee you it's different than a failure to fire. Is it different than the stovepipe? To me, they feel a little bit the same, but there is a slight difference, and it's so slight I might not actually notice it under high stress, but there's that possibility. Your gun may be slightly different, but the fact remains that if I can diagnose this is what my problem is, do I need to attempt other methods of clearance first? There's a school of thought out there that I shouldn't even look at the gun, I should just clear the malfunction. 
I don't really agree with that because of human nature, my eyes are going to be my biggest source of data. So I'm bound to look at the gun. The gun's already in my peripheral vision. It's already in my visual horizon. So why not waste, why waste the time of trying to fix a malfunction when I can visually diagnose it and then fix it? So if I'm pressed into my threat, that trigger's a lot different than a failure to fire. I didn't get a strike. Now, if the gun's in my peripheral vision, I just diagnose the malfunction. And since I know the new method, there's no reason to attempt remedial action first. I should go straight into stripping the magazine, racking the gun if I feel that's necessary, reinserting the magazine, racking the gun, and engaging my threat if I need to. If his behavior has changed, I'll just point the gun at him and go for compliance. But if he still needs to be shot, that's what I'm going to do. That significantly shortens the chain of events and chain of things that have to happen before I get my gun back up. Now, there is no fast way to clear a double feed, but that is a much faster way than the way you may have learned. Um, one of the arguments I've already heard with this method, and, and I was able to disprove it right then and there because the student was in front of me, is, well, you should rack it more than once. And my feeling to that is the whole purpose of racking the gun is to clear the chamber and allow for an empty chamber to load another mag or to load another round. So if I have a double feed and I get that magazine out of there and I rack it and brass comes out, that tells me the extractor is functioning. At that point, do I need to rack it again on an empty chamber? Two more times? What does that do for me? It does absolutely nothing. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. Stop doing it. If the chamber clears, reload the gun. There's no reason to add unnecessary racks to the process. Now, some people, depending on the condition of the weapon, may say, well, once you get it back in battery, go ahead and rack it one more time, sacrifice a round to make sure the gun is functioning. In a combat environment or a, or a uh, I would say, a, a debris-laden environment, very dirty environment, mud, whatever, maybe that's something to do. Uh, but if you're like some people who only carry that one magazine, do you really want to give up that round? When you've already seen, when you cleared the malfunction, that brass came out. Something came out of that gun and the extractor was responsible for it. So at this point, do we need to keep racking the gun and wasting live ammunition that we could need to save ourselves uh, to prove what we've already kind of proven? Rack it until it clears the chamber, stop racking it, reload it, get it back in the fight. Now, of course, lastly, um, there are ways that you can kind of stack the deck in your favor when you set these malfunctions up. And because malfunctions can be set up in a way that they can be cleared uh, unlike how they're able to be cleared under what I consider to be full power. So I can set a malfunction up on the gun very gingerly, make everything work really correctly, but under full power that method may not work because the gun is violently reciprocating. So these methods have to be tested. Now just like I said, the double feed method that I went over, I've been vetting that for, for quite some time now and I haven't seen it work. If it does not work on your gun consistently, use the old method. Uh, but what I'm going to show you now is some ways that you can induce a few of these malfunctions under full power just using a 30 round AR magazine or of course any hard object will work. But this will allow you yourself or your practice partner to induce full power malfunctions on your guns. Now, of course, some people's reaction is, oh my God, that's going to hurt my gun. It's probably not. You might want to keep an eye on your front and rear sight post, uh, rear sight post, but these are some ways that you can induce full power malfunctions on your gun. It is kind of difficult to induce a double feed under full power. Uh, it is possible using that same kind of stove pipe-ish method. You just, instead of locking into the chamber area, you're going to want to move it back just a little bit to where uh, right around the grip. So if I want to induce, if I'm going to try to induce a double feed, I want to hold it here because when the slide comes to rear, I want it right in that area versus holding it here, which clears. Because this is a good way to induce a stovepipe, holding it here. But holding it here is the best way to induce that double feed, and that's what I want to do. Double feeds are actually really, really hard to induce, and they don't actually occur that often in classes. The most, most of the time when I see them is when people are limp wristing the gun, uh, or they're shooting from retention, and they just don't have a really good lock on that gun, it causes a double feed. Uh, we get a failure to extract because there's not enough uh, rigidity on the on the slide as it reciprocates and uh, it tries to attempt to load another round. So 
You can limp wrist if you want to induce that double feed. That's probably going to be your best way to do it. I just wouldn't get in the habit of it. Um, get it to work and then test your methods for clearing it. Um, I think I've covered just about every potential major handgun malfunction. Now, there are there other malfunctions? Yes. There are other very, very strange things that can occur, but those are the, the malfunctions that, that occur the most when we're talking about the function of the gun in regards to ammunition as well. Um, internal parts can break down, but there's no way to immediately or remediately fix those without actually taking the gun down, and that's not something you're going to be able to do in a couple seconds. Uh, so, as always, uh, malfunctions are something that we need to practice, but we don't need to necessarily beat them to get in the training environment. Practice them, work them into your practice, um, build a proficiency at clearing all three potential malfunctions, the three most popular potential malfunctions, and go from there. I'm Eric Allen with Sage Dynamics. Practice accordingly.